Myself. Um, I'm Dan Frisk. I'm the project leader for Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge Complex, which is down in Willows uh, uh, on Highway 5. Also, I have with me is Mark Peltz. Mark is the chief of uh, refuge planning, and you probably saw his name on the uh, on the fact sheet. Uh, kind of the, the one I put all, a lot of this to, together and, and, and they, uh, provided the updates. Also, I have uh, Jim Smith and Jim where are you at? Jim is the project leader for the Red Bluff uh, Fish and Wildlife Office. Also, I have uh, Lyle um, Lewis. Excuse me. Lyle is also with the uh, Red Bluff Fish and Wildlife Office. Uh, and then I also have uh, Craig Izola. He's with the Sacramento office and is the easement manager for uh, for the complex there, primarily wetland easements. And I also have Matt Hammond. Matt is our private lands biologist. And I think we got Shelly uh, Wingo, and she is uh, another private lands biologist, probably worked with a lot of the ranches out here, and she works in the Red Bluff office. Um, also, we have with us uh, Dave Muir with the Congressman Herger's office. Dave, if you want to just, all right. All right, appreciate you coming out. All right, well, first off, I'd just like to uh, kind of give you the, uh, the sequence of this for tonight. Uh, Mark will be following uh, my introduction and giving you an overview of the conservation easement program. He has about a 30-minute PowerPoint that he'll go over, uh, kind of go into specifics of what the proposal is. And then after that, he, it, there'll be time for some, some general questions on that. And then we're going to open it up into basically a question-answer session. That'll last about 15 minutes where you just ask questions and we'll have a few folks here recording your, your comments. And the key thing is uh, we want to make sure we get all those uh, questions uh, recorded. And then we're going to, after that, after that 15 minutes, we're going to break down in more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and we're going to kind of break into different, different areas. So if you have individual questions, you just want to talk one on one, one with any of us here with the Fish and Wildlife, you could do that. We also have comment sheets. I think you picked those up when you came into the, uh, into the room. Uh, first off, uh, make sure, uh, if, again, if you have questions or concerns, that you go ahead and, and document those on those cards and get those to us. But also on the back side of the, uh, of the planning update, there's also a, uh, a place you can mail any comments later on. Um, but uh, one of the things, uh, and, and, and we want to wrap this up around 8 o'clock, so we're looking about two hours um, to, uh, to kind of open this question and answer discussion. Um, to make this meeting productive and, and to capture everyone's uh, comments or concerns, we like to just kind of set some, some general rules tonight for the meeting to kind of keep it on, on schedule. And uh, the first off is, you know, the one person will speak at a time. So when we get to the question and answer, we'll ask one person, you know, kind of speak. We'll, we'll try to capture those questions here and then move on to the next. Keep the facilitators <laughs> accurate. So if we didn't get something captured, make sure we get that captured before the night's out. Um, be hard on the issues, not on, on the people. <laughs> Uh, respect other people's opinions. So again, this is an open forum. We want to hear everybody's comments. So we, all we ask is we respect each other's comments and opinions. We want to build on other people's ideas uh, from others. So 
If we get to a certain topic, we may build upon that as we go on our the question and answer. And then I would just ask too to you know to keep it brief. I see we have a lot of folks here today. It's great to see the great turnout. So we want to make sure that we get everybody's questions uh, at least addressed. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Pelz. Mark. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, the, um, I've, as Dan said, I'm going to give you just an overview, or not in anyone's way here, of the uh, California, this proposed California Foothills Legacy Area, and uh, just tell you a little about what the, what the proposal is, what conservation easements are, and um, tell you maybe, give you some reasons why a landowner might be interested in, in an easement. And then, uh, and then tell us, tell you a little bit more about fish and wildlife service and why we're we're interested in this program. So, that said, so the uh, California Foothills Legacy Area is a proposed new um, easement program to protect working landscapes um, in the foothills surrounding the Central Valley. And um, there's some maps scattered all the way around the room. And I think a lot of you did you get the uh, the planning update that was handed out. Hopefully, we didn't run out of those. But um, there's a map on there too. But gives you we've uh, um, this is a proposal that was developed in, in cooperation uh, with the California Rangeland Conservation Coalition, which is a group of a lot of different organizations. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service is one of the, the founding members, uh, and this is it's basically our uh, it's helping to achieve some of the goals that have been identified by the coalition, and uh, one of those is is the need to uh, to keep kind of working landscapes um, economically viable and. Uh, and, uh, and conserve the, the values that are that found there just as they're in private hands. Um, the uh, coalition members have pledged to work together in the Rangeland Coalition to preserve and enhance California's rangeland for species of concern while supporting the long-term viability of the ranching industry. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later, We have, as, as Dan mentioned, we have existing uh, wetland conservation easement program in the valley floor. And um, it's very successful. It's been around for I think it's 30, maybe 40 years, and uh, we're trying to build on that model. Um, that said, there are a lot of uh, other groups that are doing uh, similar programs um, throughout the Central Valley, the California Range Land Trust. Um, there's a lot of uh, regional land trust throughout the area, and we're not looking to replace the good work that they're doing. Um, it's, it's really important. We're looking to partner um, with them and to just provide, maybe tap into some other resources that are available through, uh, through uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So, um, we've, it's been made clear to us by a number of those partners within the Rangeland Coalition that, that the, uh, the demand for easements far outstrips the uh, supply of funding for them right now. So that's, that's been true in a lot of cases. So, the whole reason we're doing this study, basically, is it, it's a concept now, it's not a plan. Um, really all you see, we have maps, we have a few ideas of what it might look like. Those are kind of laid out in the planning update, but we're here to kind of get your input on it to see if, if is there a role for Fish and Wildlife Service uh, in an easement program in the foothills. So. Okay. I already lost my remote control here. So there, uh, as you can see, this is the same map that's in your planning update. Um, there, are, there have been four preliminary focal areas that have been identified. The uh, closest one here is Tehama Foothills, which is uh, basically kind of surrounding us right here. This is a generalized version on the, the, and the map that you have in your planning update. If you want to look at a more detailed version, um, look on the maps that are in the back, kind of scattered around the room, and there's a few outside here that they show in a lot, um, a lot more detail. So, these are uh, these areas were developed um, or identified based on there was a prioritization effort that the California Rangeland Conservation Coalition uh, did a couple of years ago, and basically identifying grassland rangeland areas that are high value for um, for wildlife, and uh, so that that's how we ended up with these. So this is a map that they developed. It's a little, I'm sure you probably can't see any of the details on this, but the same map uh, or similar map is actually shown here if you want to come up after the meeting and see it in a little bit more legible format. But so the areas that are blue here, 
Areas that are blue are areas that are considered uh, critical to the Rangeland Coalition's goals. The areas that are uh, lighter blue um, are areas that are important to the Rangeland Coalition goals. So these are all, again, they're all privately held uh, rangelands and ranches sort of in the Central Valley. You can kind of see the patterns here. You'll notice that, um, sorry, yeah, the, this large block here in the central Sierra foothills, the Tehama foothills up here, the, uh, this is the, what we call the Sequoia foothills, and then the fourth one that we've identified is the, uh, over here on the coast range, is basically the area between Pinnacles National Monument and the Pinoche Hills, what we call it the San Benito foothill. So those are, again, these are just preliminary. We've, we've got a lot of comments. We've had four scoping meetings so far, and there's been some folks that said, you know, we don't want to be in a focal area, and that's, um, that's the kind of input we're looking for now. And there's also folks that said, you know, how come you didn't include our area in focal area? So we're looking for that input. We don't think that we got it perfect by any means. This was kind of our first stab at, at areas um, that we would focus this program on. But um, we definitely want to hear your input. All right, so just to give you a little background on um, what are easements. Um, so some of you, this may already, you may be already familiar with it, and um, but these are just some general concepts. And um, again, Craig or other folks, if I, if they're the experts. At, if you have any uh, questions, maybe later on you can ask them. But uh, so an easement is a permanent agreement between a landowner and um, the government, or it could be a land trust or, or other group. It's uh, recorded as a, a property deed with the county, um, and it can't be changed without agreement of both parties, and that's important because we did have some questions at, at some of our meetings early on, is, well, what if the government decides that they want to, um, you know, include something else in it? Well, that, that can't be done. Once it's agreed to, um, and by both parties, then it, it's, it's, it's permanent. The, uh, the owner controls access and retains all rights not specifically prohibited or limited in the easement. So, um, and we had also had questions about, well, is this, do I have to allow public access on the land? And basically, no, I think none of our conservation easements in California do we allow, do you have to allow public access? Basically, you retain control of that. The uh, rights typically granted by the landowner include the right to limit development and the right to monitor the terms of the agreement. And that's also, a, and for some folks, that's a little scary, and I just wanted to specify that that, the terms of the agreement, um, so let's say if, if the easement just limits development, well, we basically need to make sure that there's no development. We're not going to go snooping around the property. And it's laid out very specifically in the, in the easement document, the details. And uh, so if you do have any questions about what that might look like, um, then you can talk to, to Craig. Um, another question that's often asked, so how is an easement value determined? Uh, so an appraiser will perform an, a market analysis um, of the value of the property based on the highest and best use of the land. And um, that basically means, uh, you know, what's the most uh, valuable use of the land? Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean what's, what's likely now, it kind of means in perpetuity, because the easements are in perpetuity. What could be done with that land? What would give it the most value? in terms of monetary value. And then um, that's done by looking at similar properties that are selling and what they're selling for uh, in the area. And then an appraiser will, de will uh, determine the uh, value of the property with the restrictions in place, so with the easement restrictions. And then the difference between the before and after is the, uh, the value of the easement. So that's kind of an oversimplification, um, but that's a general process. There are all sorts of, of uh, variables, um, but in general that, that's the process. So, so the typical payments for easements are uh, based on the extent of the restrictions and the market value for land in the region. So those could vary um, from one, you know, quite a bit to uh, even within an area and, and between areas. Um, so, for example, an easement on a property that's in the Bay Area obviously uh, could be you know, valued a lot differently than something that's in rural uh, Kern County. The, uh, 
So easement values in general run from 35 to 65 percent of market value, and don't, that's not a hard number. It can be higher than that. It can be lower than that. Um, this is just kind of the rule of thumb that the uh, California Rangeland Trust uses. So that's um, in general. But that is. so again, that depends on um, where you're at. So how would the program work? Um, so basically, we it would acquire conservation easements from voluntary participants. Um, the, it would be focused in on uh, the focal areas that we've identified. So the way the Fish and Wildlife Service um, programs work, we can't acquire any lands unless they're within what we call an approved boundary. And that's why we go through this planning process, um, is to establish that, that boundary. Um, so in this case, there are the four focal areas identified. So assuming those were um, ended up um, getting, that the decision was based on those, and that's the only places we could acquire these easements. Um, the acreage goals, uh, most likely in this case, then you know, we, we're, well, certainly we wouldn't be trying to acquire every acre within there because you know not everybody certainly is going to be willing to sell. There are other conservation groups that are acquiring or land trusts that are acquiring easements, and um, so what we would most likely happen will be as an acreage goal for a particular area. So let's say for Tehama Foothills, I think um, the folk area that's been, this one that's on the map is maybe 400,000 acres. So there might be a certain either percentage or something of that nature. But that's something that we'd like feedback on from you too. Um, the funding for uh, these easements uh, is not set in stone, but it, we think it would be from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It's probably the best fit. And what uh, Land and Water Conservation <coughs> Fund, or LWCF is what we call it for short, is it's the royalties paid by oil companies for oil and gas development that's offshore, basically, on the outer continental shelf. So this is money that um, I just looked on a website today. There, It varies, like, obviously, um, it varies depending on, I think, the uh, prices of the uh, in the in the markets, but I think it generates, you know, it's in the uh, the multiple billions of dollars a year that come in. Um, so each year, Congress appropriates a certain amount of that into the Land and Water Conservation Fund. The authorization, so that in the Land and Water Conservation Act, which kind of set up this whole program, it was a. Uh, <coughs> I think it was authorized to roughly about 900 million or a billion dollars a year. And so that's used for a lot of, it's used for national parks, it's used for um, fish and wildlife service refuges, it's used for forest service, it's used for, um, I think really BLM uses it. And then it's also used, there's a, a stateside, it's called stateside grant program for parks. So many of the community parks and uh, those kind of community features are actually, were uh, paid for through grants through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So I think this, uh, the funding level has varied quite a bit from year to year. I think the most that's ever been appropriated by Congress was about uh, 900 million, and, uh, but it's been, I think this year, it's uh, in the low hundreds of millions, so. Did you mention where the grant comes from? I mean, I guess the bill will Yeah, so it, yeah, it's, it comes from the, it's basically royalties paid by. So the, the thought is, is that, that it's, it's, it's land that belongs to everyone, the offshore lands that are, are uh, basically the, within the United States boundary, then they're paying back the American people into this, uh, what are called royalties for the use of those resources. So, so this is, um, these are some reasons to participate that a lander might be interested in participating in an easement program. Um, and these are based on some of the input we've got from uh, some of the uh, earlier meetings. Uh, one obviously is the monetary benefit. The uh, you know it's a, it could be a business decision. There's some folks that may take the uh, proceeds that, from selling the easement and buy another piece of another ranch, maybe, um, or you know it could be any number of things. Uh, it would be theirs to do with as they please. The uh, another reason might be generational transfer of uh, land or property and. Um, I'm certainly not a tax expert or a lawyer, but um, one of the examples that was given at, at one of our other meetings was that, let's say if, you, if a, uh, a rancher has a, a so is, is looking to pass on to, let's say, two heirs, a, a, 
and only one of them wants to stay in ranching. Well, the property itself is not very liquid. It's kind of hard, you can't, you know, not necessarily split it um, in half. So easement might provide one way to make it, but that asset a little more liquid. So one of the heirs could be, you know, take the money, the other one could, could stick with the ranch. So uh, one option. Uh, another uh, one that was brought up repeatedly was keeping the land the way it is. And I know for a lot of ranchers, their land is, is really important to them and, and they'd like to see it continue um, that way in, into the future. As, as one woman, oh, it's been funny, one woman at our previous meeting in Sonora said, well, I don't trust my daughters, you know. I'd like to see it stay where it is now. So she thought she was worried they would take the, sell it off and buy a car. Um, another, uh, one of the other reasons is just, just sustaining the ranching lifestyle. I and mean, this is, ranching's been around since before California was a state. You know, many of the lands that we now have our homes on were, were previously ranches, so I think that's pretty important uh, cultural. Um, so why is the Fish and Wildlife Service interested in conserving ranch land? Uh, uh, just to give you a, a few of the reasons, um, sort of kind of summarize, you know, it does have a really high uh, wildlife value, and Fish and Wildlife Service is uh, their uh, primary mission is basically to conserve wildlife and promote wildlife dependent recreation. But um, one of the reasons been cited is as oak woodlands, which are you know real important part of rangelands um, in California, are one of the top three habitats in North America, or thought to be for bird species richness. That's the number of uh, species of birds that are found there. Um, Another reason is that uh, oak savanna and grassland um, are thought to support the highest uh, density and diversity of wintering raptors, that's, that's owls and hawks and eagles and such, um, of anywhere in North America. So they're really important, and that, that's something that's been kind of recently uh, uh, been uh, discovered. And an uh, important part, um, too, is that many of the species that, that uh, which you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service are what we call our trust species, like migratory birds, are um, really do benefit from the grazing that goes on as part of um, the, the management that's done by ranchers. So, and a lot of them actually don't even occur there if you take grazing off the land. Um, another important point is that you know the habitat for these species in general largely persists today due to the, the stewardship practices practices of these ranchers and uh, will only continue to provide this important working landscape if they stay in ranching. So just a, a few other uh, rangeland benefits. Um, obviously forage production, you know, providing food for, for cattle. Um, the next two, water yield and water quality. Uh, if you think about it, most of California's surface waters flow through rangeland at least at one point. So it, water is the, basically the foundation of our economy in California, so obviously it's really important. Um, and another one is uh, pollination. This has been a, kind of a recent, uh, uh, or recently brought to my attention is that, I don't know if any of you have heard of calling collapse disorder. It's a lot of bees are dying off in, in certain areas throughout actually the world, but it's thought that um, discovered recently that actually bee colonies do tend to do better when they're near um, natural lands like range lands than they do when they're surrounded by more developed landscapes. So just, just to highlight a few of the rangeland benefits, um, there are many others um, that aren't on this list. Uh, that said, their rangelands are also one of the most threatened habitats in the, throughout the western United, United States. Um, so in California between 19... Uh, 1984 and 2006, over 400,000 acres have been um, lost, and that's either to urban development, um, what we call kind of rural residential development, which is basically subdividing ranches into, um, could be ranchettes or smaller parcels, and um, also to more intensive ag, too. And then it's predicted that within another 50 years, another million acres um, within this same kind of study area could be lost. Um, another big uh, threat, I think, which is um, if those of you that are in ranching are probably intimately familiar with, is, is the potential loss of, well, not the potential, the actual loss of Williamson Act funding. Um, is everybody familiar with the Williamson Act? I can, 
I see mostly nods. So I'll just briefly, it's basically a, um, it's a program where a landowner, a agricultural landowner will, will sign up for a, I think it's a 10 year or in some cases now a nine year contract. They agree not to develop their land and in exchange they, they pay a reduced property tax rate. Um, it's based on how they use that land. So there, there are millions of acres in California. They're shown on that map, I think it's in the far right hand corner, um, shows the Williamson Act lands in California, at least a, that's a snapshot in time, it's kind of rapidly changing. But um, anyways, the state payments for this program have been reduced to near zero for the last, I think it's been three years. And um, so UC Davis did a, a study of, um, or a survey of ranchers throughout um, throughout the state, and uh, these were some of the results they found, is that nearly a quarter of the ranchers were likely or very likely to um, end their entire ranching enterprise if they lost this Williamson Act, um, the reduced property tax rate. Another 42% uh, of surveyed ranchers said they would sell some or all of their range land without the support of the Williamson Act. And then another 56% uh, of ranchers predicted their sold land would be developed for non-agricultural uses. So clearly it's, it's, a, it's a concern. And it, without, there are some counties that have said they will continue the Williamson Act program even without the state payments, but it's, you know, with the way that uh, finances are, I think in most counties that's going to be difficult. So this is a this is the boring slide, of course, in the presentation, but this is showing the process. Um, where we're at now is the, uh, the public scoping meetings on the far corner, uh, edge there. So this is our chance to get input from you on a proposal. What, what do you think? Um, and also on the scope of issues that will be addressed in the environmental um, document. We're, we're going to be doing what we call an environmental assessment. It looks at, um, looks at the proposal and any alternatives to that proposal, and then also looks at their environmental impact. So, what would the the uh, how would it affect wildlife? How would it affect let's say property taxes or even just the regional economy? So, we'll take that input. We'll use that. Um, we'll be sending out a, a planning update or a newsletter like the one that you have. We handed out. That will be in um, probably in August or September, which will summarize all the scoping comments and. Um, the uh, next step will be using that input, we'll develop alternatives, and um, those will be, again, looked at in an environmental assessment, which will be uh, available in the spring of 2012, so a little, uh, about a year from now. So that draft will go out for public review, a chance to look at that, and then um, we'll also have another series of public meetings, which we'll definitely have to get a bigger room for, of course. Um, and. Uh, after that, we'll take the public comments, um, we'll revise that document, and develop a uh, final environmental assessment. The goal is to have that done in summer of 2012. And then after that is implementation of the project. So one of the things I wanted to mention too is that there's no funding automatically set aside for this project, particularly with the, the source of funding that we're talking about using. It'll be up to uh, Congress to appropriate it. So just the whole result of this process would be basically those approved boundaries which I mentioned before. And then if Congress decides to appropriate money for projects, then that's how they would be funded. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about who we are, the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and the National Wildlife Refuge System, which is uh, where um, basically this new proposal would, if, if approved, would be part of. The first refuge was Pelican Island, which was established in 1903, um, and today it was by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, today there are, over, there are 553 National Wildlife Refuges on over 150 million acres and more than 35 million visitors a year. So, I, I, um, there have been a lot of studies that looked at how much that visitation contributes to the regional economies. It's a huge number. I don't uh, don't have it off the top of my head, but. You know, if you think about you know visitors to national parks, to wildlife refuges, they're spending money in the local communities, and that kind of spreads throughout. But, um, the important thing about the refuge system too is that it's the largest system of lands in the world dedicated to wildlife conservation. And um, so, another <coughs> distinction too between the refuge system and a lot of other uh, public lands, let's say like BLM lands and Forest Service lands, is that. Um, 
those are all multiple uses. They have to kind of, they balance uh, different, let's say on, on Forest Service land, it's logging, it's recreation, it may be minerals, um, and say the BLM lands. Whereas in, for National Wildlife Refuges, the way that, that Congress uh, set up the system was that it, it's, it's, it's basically for wildlife and, um, and also for, to support wildlife dependent recreation, hunting, fishing, um, wildlife observation. Photography, environmental education, interpretation. So this is just a map showing the uh, extent of the refuge system in the United States. Uh, uh, maybe a little data because it's from last year, but um, there's a refuge in every state in the union. Um, but there, there are a lot of diversity in the types of refuges. There, are, some of you may have visited um, some of the refuges that, that Dan manages, the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge Complex down off of five. That's kind of the more traditional waterfowl refuge. We have uh, lots of different um, types of refuges. So. This map shows the uh, basically the boundary for our what we call the Pacific Southwest region of Fish and Wildlife Service. That's the one that we're in now. Um, so we have, I believe it's 43, um, 43 refuges within the. Uh, Sorry, 39 refuges in California, and uh, about 460,000 acres of, of land total, and uh, within California, about a quarter of those are conservation easements. And um, Dan mentioned the the, the uh, easement programs that we have in uh, in his refuge complex, and they're, they're those are primarily um, wetland easements, as he said. They're mostly on duck clubs and. Uh, so they're scattered, there are actually five different easement refuges. I don't know if you'll be able to see those, those blue lines there, but um, so starting with the north, uh, north central valley, Butte Sink, and the Willow Creek Lower Line wildlife management areas, and then in the, uh, the, the oldest, I believe, uh, wildlife management areas, grasslands, which is around Los Banos, and um, and then Tulare Basin Wildlife Management Area, which is in the south. So that's actually the newest, just only been online for a couple of years. So again, those are all geared for wetland, private wetlands. They're all willing seller easement programs. Um, they're not all exactly the same, but they're very similar. Um, so basically, um, we're looking to build, like I said before, this is a program that's been around for a while, it's been highly successful. A lot of the, uh, the Fish and Service each, I think it's each year, nearly every year does this, what they call State of the Birds Report, which is looking at uh, bird populations kind of throughout the um, United States. And one of the things that it consistently been showing is that the populations that we manage these wetlands for, which are the waterfowl and the water birds, are are, are doing quite well, and the reason being is that these refuges, these um, a lot of easement refuges and other refuges that we have in P, like Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge, have been really successful at providing habitat for these birds, and um, so we're looking to kind of expand on that model, model to look up at the foothills and this other really important resource. So that's just kind of giving you a summary of the, the proposal. So now we want to hear what you think or questions that you have, as Dan said. Um, we do have a uh, what we call a scoping period that it's a formal period that um, we'd like to get your comments by July 15th. I think that's on the planning update. It's also on the um, the uh, comment card that we handed out. So you can either you can hand that to one of us tonight if you put your comment on there. You can um, mail it to me at the address that's actually on the comment card, or you can hit it here. Um, you can fax us your comments, and or you can email them uh, either way to send them to me at this address. But we really want to hear from you what you think um, about this proposal. So at that, I'll, uh, so any, uh, I guess, any questions about the proposal? Put that back up. Sure. Go. Yeah, yeah. Or you, oh, I'm sorry, you want the contact? Bill, I sent you that one. So, and also I want to uh, see some hands up. If you can talk, I don't think we'll have time because of the large group to move the microphone around. Um, but if you can make sure you talk really loud so everybody can hear. Public's not allowed on private ranch land. 
what would cause people to come here to see birds if they can't come on the problem? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> good questions, no. And, uh, and I, I guess, yeah, when that, that number there is, is primarily up, and we have a lot of recreation on refuges, we have a large hunt program like on Sacramento Refuge. Um, those are all, um, those are the primary drivers of visitation within the refuge system. So, I mean, there are benefits for easement refuges to the local economy, which are a little more subtle, probably, than the ones for, for like, wait, let me Yeah, if, if, um, if, you know, we're looking at populations, so to have viable, sustainable populations through the flyway, um, it's, you know, just important to have these areas protected. It'll keep the wildlife and things that I think draw people to Northern California to see, you know, all the natural resources, the great rangelands here. That will keep those wildlife in here, and that's what we're looking at. Same thing occurs on our wetland easements on the SAC complex. I mean, a lot of those are private hunt clubs, but I mean, it provides, you know, um, and a lot of those are sanctuary, which provides a, a wintering area for the, for the wildlife, and these birds move around, so. Again, it, it, it's that looking at that population size, not the, you know the individual areas. So, yeah, I have a question for you. Uh, one of the things that I'm having trouble with here is is why we who own the land will want to turn control of it over to you. Right? There's a standard saying around here that says, "I'm from the federal government. I'm here to help you." <laughs> government produces nothing. The people that are sitting on here produce everything. You're going to take our tax money and then pay us from our tax money so you can control the property? So, yeah, it, it, it's a voluntary program, so there's no, you know, nobody would be compelling you to do that. So I, I think I, if you remember that slide I had earlier about there are, there are reasons and they're not, not everybody buys into them of why you would want to um, sell an easement. And some of them, for some people, it's a monetary reason. Um, it may be, you know, to pass on their land, you know, as inheritance. But the reason why, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service is interested is because of our, our mission with wildlife conservation. And then from our perspective, seeing these lands stay as ranch lands is, is, is a great thing for wildlife. So if I have a piece of property and all of my neighbors around me want to buy into this conservation thing, and I don't, then if I decide I want to put a little development right in the middle, you're going to buy into That's that? entirely up to you, yeah. You, yeah. I just kind of want you to answer question number one again because I don't think you answered the question. I didn't get what she asked out of that question answer. How would it benefit the local people? Yeah. yeah, how is that going to attract people is what she asked. Well, I don't, I don't think it will attract, you know, if they have it. I mean, as we get this across the landscape, the, the, these different conserved areas, we have the wildlife, it keeps the wildlife here. I mean, I think all the people around will benefit from that because these birds move around. They're not static. Um, and then I think people come to enjoy that wildlife view, and, and then they, they recreate, they, they stay in the hotels and eat in the restaurants, and they come around. But again, these, these are the things that we're looking at, um, you know, to try to, on the landscape. You know, we have to manage stuff on the landscape. These habitats are disappearing, and this is just a proposal to protect these wild areas on the landscape. I have, I have two questions. Number one, it seems like you guys are putting a lot of effort into something that we would consider reinventing the wheel. If the Williamson Act worked quite well, why not put all the effort and time and resources back into reestablishing the Williamson Act? Yeah. And then, uh, 